So I'm going to come across as salty. It's something that has been bugging me because as much as I love that other people talk about us, there is no apostrophe in dad's drinking bourbon. I mean, I don't put an apostrophe when I type y'all unless autocorrect does it. Dad apostrophe S implies one dad, singular, possessing the drinking bourbon. Dads with no apostrophe is plural, so it's two dads drinking bourbon. What about dads with an apostrophe after this? Because I've seen that before. I I don't know what it means, but I know it exists. So that would be both of our drinking bourbon. Both of our what? So we would possess the drinking bourbon. So if it's a plural possessive with an apostrophe after the S, that's signify it's our drinking bourbon. Well, either way, you're making this dad want to drink. Jesus. Well, shit, let's do it. Everyone, my name is John Edwards, and with me is Zeke Baker, and together we make the Dad Shrinking Bourbon. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, thank you for making us part of your day. How you doing, Zeke? If you like pina coladas <laughs> and getting down in the rain. I'm not going to sing. It is Do you know who sings that, though? The pina colada song? Yeah. I don't know, but whoever he is, he wants you to come with him and escape. <laughs> Rupert Holmes. That is not the name I would expect to sing the Pina Colada song. Exactly. He sounds like a dude who wrote it in his mom's basement. Uh, but I will say there's a, I guess, a one-off version of it that instead of Pina Colada says Red Bull and Vodka by a guy named Sonny Ledford. It's amazing. I'm just going to throw that out there right now. And one of your favorite artists wrote Red Solo Cup. Hey, my grandma loved that song. <laughs> <laughs> She'd sing it all the time this time of year. I, well, used, I used to sell that vodka. <laughs> there was a vodka red solo cup. I was just going to introduce you, my friend, but we do have a very, very special guest in the studio. He, you know him. You love him. He's been on before. He will be on again. Our friend PJ Harrison. How are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Good. Is there still red solo cup vodka? No. It has been uh, DQ'd, sadly. In the state, but yes, there was a vodka red solo cup, and there was a rum, I believe, right after the song came out. I bet they could probably still sell it in Vegas, that uh, casino he's part of. Yeah, probably. That song was so damn annoying. Oh man, so my little uh, five foot one, like ninety five pound grandma, like all around Christmas, she's all around red solo cup. She'd have one in her hand too, and just smile, get her a few pours of wine in, and she just kept singing it over and over, and you couldn't help but laugh. It's one of those ones that is an earworm, though, because it's like red solo cup, I fill you up. I'm not going to sing the rest of it because I want to pay him. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants me singing. I can guarantee that. <laughs> it is hot as balls in this room. I just want to mention that. So these are we are winding down. These mobile studio episodes, I will be closing on my house here soon, and we will have our official Dad's Drinking Bourbon studio. So, PJ, next time you come on, you will probably be coming on there. Zeke and I just have next week in this room. The rest of the clubhouse is cool and nice. This one room, somebody cranked the heat up. Zeke had to roll up his pant legs. Yeah, like Huck Finn over here. I mean, it might be 20 degrees outside, but that pool's looking really inviting <laughs> right now. <laughs> I, I don't know how you still have a sweatshirt on. Uh, but you brought something for us to drink tonight. <laughs> I mean, we are <laughs> drinking. Under. Uh, there's nothing underneath. <laughs> I told him, I was like, man, you got to shed that sweatshirt. He's like, well, I was on the way out of the house, and I just threw this on, so there's nothing else. Come on, Billy Bob. You came here to work. (laughs) So tell everyone what you brought for us to drink, because those of you that know you, you are with Treaty Oak. You're with Papa's Pilar. What else do you have in your repertoire? Uh, Right now, it is the Treaty Oak whiskey, the Papa's Pilar rum, and then the Waterloo gin which I know you guys have posted some pictures about the Waterloo Gin. There have been some great Waterloo Gins in Nashville. Yes, yes. So the barrel picks are going well and the cast strength. 
Uh, stuff's fantastic. But tonight, I brought the Papas Polar Marquesas Blend. It is our version of Ron Call, the master distiller blender with Papas Polar. It is his version of a rum and whiskey mixed together. Is that what Ron Call is? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's the right call. Did you not say wrong call? Ron, R-O-S, oh. Ron call. Oh, my bad. You, 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 <laughs> you, I'm completely green here on rum. Like, honestly, I, I know nothing other than it's a spirit. Yeah, you should no. start making up some words. Making up words? Like for Zeke about rum and just like throw some things in there that he has no idea about and then tell him afterwards. But... It's actually named after a location in the Florida Keys, correct? Yes. The Marquesas Islands are 20 miles west of Key West. Uh, No one lives on them, but it was Hemingway's first experience of saltwater fishing. He grew up in the Illinois, um, Michigan area. He grew up in there, and he always loved to freshwater fish. So he went down to the Keys. He went with his buddies, and he went saltwater fishing and fell in love with it. There was a storm. He got basically marooned, him and his buddies, on this little island, the Marquesas Islands, for a couple days. And the only thing he had on his boat was rum and whiskey. And so Ron Call, listening to this story about Hemingway, said this would be a great combination of trying to join the both together. Now, tell everyone a little bit about Papa's Pilar before we go to the questions that I know Zeke has. Let's at least establish the company because they have a story down in Key West. Mm -hmm. Where else are they? What states are they in? Because I know Barrels and Brews had a great Papa's Pilar pick last year at Carruthers Wine and Spirits. Then I know uh, Tarek at Elixir has had a bunch of great uh, Papa's Pilar picks. And they've also been in town in Nashville. So for those of us in Nashville, we know Papa's Pilar. Not everybody might know them. Uh, we are Our home base is Key West. We also have a facility in Lakeland, Florida, that the majority of our blending and production is done. Uh, we're in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, California, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Washington, and Oregon. Damn. Right now, yes. If I can, if I, I might have missed a few, but I know, I know we're in those locations. It's named after Ernest Hemingway. His nickname was Papa. His boat was Polar. So that's where we get our name from. The bottle shape is a canteen or a World War I, World War II water canteen. Hemingway served in World War I, and there was a war correspondent in World War II. So to honor him, we have the bottle shape in a canteen. And then the other thing is we are based out of Key West. That if anyone's ever been down in Key West, there's roosters everywhere. So that little medallion on the front symbolizes Key West. <laughs> Zeke is messing with the thing right in front of the microphone. Hey, I'm just trying to read here, son. <laughs> Everything's getting picked up as you're opening that thing up. Well, he got to talking about this bottle. If you get this thing gripped the right way, and I tell John how fast can you run. Not very fast. <laughs> I think I could clock him pretty good with a good throw. Well, I like the whole thing about the bottle. I mean, it's got some weight, too. I mean, yeah. even the oh, top yeah. is metal or manufactured to feel like metal. It's a nice, there's the sundial on top. It's a nice looking bottle. It's like a squat, but cooler. Yeah, we have actually our uh, our flagship was has that, that has a silver top uh, that has a, a compass on it for his time he spent going back and forth back and forth to Key West and Cuba, and then the dark versions will have the sun for his time spent hunting in the Serengeti, and then the blonde is the compass for his time sailing. So when does the old man in the sea come into play? There's some versions in the works. Uh, I don't know how far in detail they're going to go with that, but there are things in the works. Tell us a little bit about the rum itself. What do they make it out of? I mean, knowing that it's molasses, but what? what educate Zeke on rum and actually what goes into this, because I know he's sitting over there befuddled. So all our rums that we do source from throughout the Caribbean and Central America are molasses-based. Uh, some of them are copper pot stilled. Some of them are column stilled. When we get them, the, we blend them together. There are seven hand-selected premium rums, uh, Barbados, Panama, Dominican Republic, all throughout the Caribbean. Uh, we source those seven rums. We blend it together to get a flavor profile. The oldest rum in there is 24 years. There are younger rums in there as well. And once we blend, um, it'll hit two bourbon barrels a port barrel, and a sherry barrel through our Solaire system. 
And then this blend specifically went back into a Kentucky straight char four bourbon barrel to get those whiskey characteristics um, from the Hemingway story on the islands of he, you know, he had whiskey and rum mm-hmm. married together. So even though they are sourcing rum right now, it still goes through a pretty intensive process after it goes back to the distillery. Yes. So we're, we're distilling a little bit, but yeah, he hand selects all the rums, goes through all the islands and all the aging of the rum is done on the islands of origin. So we don't pick any clear spirit, bring it to Florida and then say it's, you know, age it for five years. Everything we pick. So a 24 year old rum is picked on that island. And I did finally figure out that Ron calls a person, not a thing. <laughs> yeah, well, Ron's a, Ron's a bourbon boy. He grew up in Kentucky. He you know, worked uh, in the you know, Kentucky distilleries for years and then went down to St. Croix and did rum. And then we got him. Well, see, I thought like Ron call meant something similar to like port call maybe. <laughs> no, no. Hey, you never know. You, you don't. You don't know. <laughs> All right, so this, how long did it, did you already say how long did it spend in the bourbon barrel after it went through the whole Solera process, all that stuff? It spends another six months in the Char 4 Kentucky Straight Bourbon Barrel. So this is a marriage of bourbon and rum. Mm-hmm. So I would have to say this would be, I mean, bourbon in and of its nature has some sweet notes to it, but the rum is super sweet. Yes. With the, you know, this is going to be... This is going to be nice, I'm, I'm thinking. What about you, Zeke? You haven't tasted it? I haven't. Yes. <laughs> I'm not on my second glass. <laughs> Just follow me here. I'm trying to set it up like we haven't. Well, if I'm not the curveball, John, then people are going to be let down. Uh-huh. You are the wild card. I mean, if nobody gives you a hard time, then th- there's no fun around here. We are not on the same page right now. But going into it, knowing what I knew about it, knowing that it was a marriage of bourbon and rum, I was pretty excited because I feel like those two would pair well together. I was more intrigued, you know, as I read the side label and the various finishing that... So the bourbon barrel finish is what, um, you know, brought to people's attention here. But if you read the label carefully, you see the other finishing that, you know, PJ mm-hmm. just mentioned that's part of just their Solera method and, and what they do just generally to their rums. And to me, that's a, a lot going on in a lot of different profiles. And to still keep that in check, to me, that that's pretty interesting because I'll at least assume you have to monitor that pretty regularly to make sure between a, a you know the port and other wine finishes that are in there and other things that you don't let any one of those sit too long or have too much of an influence because everything that comes along after that is it, still going to have, you know, like a... I guess a, a trailer effect, chaser, however you want to look at it from, from what was before. And that precedent's always going to be there and be, you know, probably dominant in the profile. But trying to look at it retrospectively and, and taste this and say, all right, can I pull this out or can I pick up on this? And, and the aspects that you do or don't pick up on are, are neat to me too, as you sit here and just try to have a, a neat pour. It's also important to, to mention that this is a dark rum. It's not Malibu or Parrot Bay. <laughs> This is a sip and rum. Obviously, everybody knows you can use dark rum in cocktails and things like that. But this is something that you could sit there and have in your glass neat and sip and not feel bad about. Well, people always ask me what the hardest part of my job is. Um, you know, this price point is going to be around forty two ninety nine for per bottle. And I always say it's not the price point. It is the general public's thinking of rum is rum and Coke. And there are so many great rums out there. And so my hardest, the hardest part of my job is convincing people is to, you know, have this on the rocks, make a great old fashioned with it without, you know, without whiskey. Um, that's just one of my, you know, parts of my job that I find a little difficult is getting people to realize you can sip rum. There are great rums out there and just pour this over some ice after dinner, have a great dessert, uh, right after dinner. Well, what is exactly the, uh, Marquesas Manhattan as I read from the neck tag? I have to be honest, I haven't even looked at that neck tag. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the final passing note was a uh, serve on the rocks, neat, or the Marquesas Manhattan. Yeah, never even looked at that. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, but no, I have not looked at it. <laughs> we, we, or at least I know I rarely, and by rarely, I mean almost never, ever mixed cocktails so i just wonder what goes into them try to get an idea for profiles yeah i am the plus one guy if i'm making a cocktail it's plus one i drink most of my spirits straight been in the industry for 
14 years now. And if it's not a plus one, I'm going somewhere else and someone else is making it for me. That's just <laughs> on Saturdays, it's usually ginger beer or some ice. And then during the week, it's neat. But other than that, I don't get fancy enough. I'm with you. I, I appreciate it when somebody else makes it, but yeah, no, so, well, Zeke, you ain't taking that kind yeah, of time. No, I'm, I have no cocktail experience whatsoever. As a former bartender, though, there's just something I like about somebody else making the drink for me <laughs> than about me making the drink for myself. So well, To me, it's like fridge space, too. I mean, I, I got four different types of milk right now. I don't need more stuff in the fridge. How do you have exactly. four different types of milk? The baby drinks whole milk. Charleston gets 2%. In the morning, he likes chocolate, and I drink skim. Interesting. When are you going to go to the almond or soy or anything of that nature? I worry about the estrogenic side effects okay. from those things. All right. All right. All right. I drank almond milk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought that's where you were going. I didn't want to I didn't want to spike your own volleyball. I mean, this does go well in eggnog. Well, can we, no. Can we get to that of milk? I mean, I just think at my size, I don't need to be drinking... You know, I know Napoleon said I could have whole milk if I wanted to, but I thought that you were on the gym kick. You were snorting whey protein like it was cocaine or something. I have been having whey protein for breakfast and lunch. <laughs> Called it. Hey, You're right on spot on. I could see it in the mustache. Mm -hmm. No, there's no way. I, I use a blender. I have one of those little <laughs> blenders. That, you know, sometimes I use oh, a shaker. <laughs> Only John defends that one. <laughs> I'll defend anything. I should have been a lawyer. <laughs> Let's drink this and talk about it. I've loved it. The nose is sweet. I mean, I definitely get that molasses. It's a rum on the nose. That isn't my only note. Don't worry. But Ron, the person, Ron Call, uh, he also picked this at 88 proof. Um, so normally our expressions are um, 84, 86. Uh, he picked this one at 88, a little bit higher proof. To draw some of the more whiskey characteristics into it. I'm going to tee that up because just from us, you know, talking offline and other things and seeing some picks in stores and talking to the owners, I mean, the proof has danced around on the, the picks a little bit in the so past year three, right? That was very particular to Kentucky and Tennessee. Okay. So we have done um, – our standard is 84, 86, and then we've done a 95-proof bourbon. Okay. Uh, Tennessee and Kentucky was very lucky last year – and only got the five barrel. We only did five barrels of over 100 proof. So we go in to that first bourbon barrel in our Solaire process, uh, I believe, at just over 100 proof. So anywhere from 100 to 102. And so he released five barrels at that proof, and um, we were lucky enough to get him in this area. Okay. I remember hearing that and then hearing for this year that the proof would be different. And we got to figure out if there's still some of those out there. Because I need to get another one of those. I, I, I went through so. went through one or two last year that were really good. I thought they were very good. And um, Ron, he loves the rum anywhere between 80 to 86. Um, he thinks that's rum. It go higher. That's why he went to 88 is because, you know, he says anything above 86, you're kind of getting that whiskey category. You know, him and I and many stores around town have wanted a higher proof. He is a little bit against that um, just because he thinks that's more whiskey. You know, he says you don't go to Jimmy Russell. You don't go to Chris Morris at Woodford. You don't go to them and say Woodford should be at this. Turkey should be at this. And he goes, I want to make my rum. I want you to taste what I'm blending and making at the proofs that I think that are the best. So I guess with that – mentality overall is the goal to have a much more consistent product correct because i would that'd be my thought process was if there's variation then if the, that's when you would need or want to taste it at different proofs just to see how the profile does change um and i'm sure with solera it all depends on how many barrels are being dumped but when you get to mass volume and you get you know a consistent amount along with consistent time and finishing then it probably is a much more uh, just reliable product as far as what you're getting out of it yeah. I, I just want to say to mr call real quick uh, I, i'm not telling you how to blend your rum but i do know that you have a large contingent of <laughs> bourbon drinkers that would prefer something over 90 proof i'm not saying it needs to be 120 proof rum you know, you get down to those lower proofs. I mean, thankfully, rum by nature is a little bit thicker than bourbon, so you're not 
feeling like it's super thin. Mm -hmm. I don't mind if I'm working late or doing something like that. I don't mind something in the 80s. I just don't like when it tastes thin. It's also one of those things where a higher proof, it doesn't need to be crazy, but bourbon drinkers were, were conditioned to, you know, bottled and bond is 100 proof. Yeah, you know, that's kind of the standard. That is the the place where alcohol lights on fire. So the closer you get to a hundred, I think, is where we all kind of feel safer. It it just depends on the clientele that you're aiming for. I'm not telling him how to do it. I'm just telling him it's not all black and white like he thinks it is. There's some psychology going on here with a bourbon drinker. I think, and I would agree. In he very thing or he thinks you know it's very particular to this part of the country. I mean, we are just south of Kentucky where proof, you know, everyone's wanting proof and proof and proof. He just. Well, we're not by the beach, you know, <laughs> like if we were by freaking Key West, I'm sure we'd think a little differently. Uh, about there, it. Well, there's I mean, some, there's you some wonderful, a, you know, Cumberland River, you know, beaches, right? You need a lower proof for the beach days because you're going to drink all That's day. right. Exactly. Up here, we're here to get her done. You ain't got to worry about <laughs> starting in the morning and going 12 or 14 hour marathon days. Okay, Ron, just make sure those first five barrels every year get sent here. And then <laughs> there's not a problem. You know, we'll take care of those for you. And then you save the other ones for the beach folk. Well, I, I will mention we do have some special projects in the works. A lot of beaches are Are you guys in Minnesota? We are in Minnesota. Yeah, a lot of beaches in Minnesota. So, yeah. you, anyways, special projects in the works. <laughs> well, we do have some special projects that are uh, coming online in the future that you can mess with proof a little bit. So I should mention that. Uh, so that's some exciting stuff coming next year. Any hints? I'd rather not say and leave it for maybe a later show or something on, but there are some cool things coming down the pipeline. A teaser. If he brings more rum, I don't <laughs> give a shit. You know, like, yes, we should set up a teaser for a later show. Please bring more rum. Yes. I'll do it. Can I do it remote from Key West? No. Okay. Dang it. It's mainly just because we'd be jealous. Yeah, uh -huh. it's okay. Now, if we all want to go to Key West and go to the distillery, then I'm game. Zeke, what do you get off this one as you're you're tasting it and nosing it? I've been moving around on it and trying to be a little dissective, I guess, on it. Nose is really sweet and sugary, and it, it moves a lot for me. On, on the entry, I'm still trying to pinpoint what I get or where it comes from because obviously there's you know some sweet sugar molasses rum characteristics there underlying. But I get a, a fairly decent amount of what almost seems like a botanical effect to me. I mean, it's not gin, but I get a, some other stuff going on there that just reminds me of, of botanicals for some reason. That's why I was reading the label and looking again and just trying to dissect, you know, or what barrels did this go into if I had to at least hypothesize, you know, where that came from, what would my guess be? I still haven't come up with an answer, maybe after uh, <laughs> you give some notes. But it is interesting, the different spots of the palate, for me, it hits at least. Moving towards the back, I felt like the I felt like the, the sherry and the port really kind of lead to a, a, a long residual finish, especially at least from what I know of the proof and how that is in a bourbon. I don't see many bourbons that hang around that long at that low of a proof. Uh, but it really does a good job, you know, between the overall, like, I guess, tackiness of the rum and then those two different barrels weighing in the finish in my opinion gives it a nice long linger that is enjoyable i think it's fruity and floral but you mix that with the molasses nature of the rum i think that's where you almost get the botanical it's like a different effect like malt would be on a bourbon you know and, and it's not necessarily like there's botanical in there but i think it's the you know, the molasses and the sugary nature of that going with the the floral and fruit that at least I get. I'm trying to kind of separate that out. But it's not ginny to me in the, the botanical sense. It's just, I mean, rum by nature is supposed to be sweet. It's supposed to have some fruit to it. It's supposed to be... I mean, I taste a little bit of clove. Yeah. I mean, I'm getting a little clove off of this. I definitely do taste the sweetness. Um, I do get some whiskey characteristics. There's definitely something going on in there that's not just sweet. That, mm -hmm. That's what I've honestly been sitting there. A, a reason for not a ton of words is like, all right, what what is that? Just trying to pinpoint it and and figure out what's really plugging in where. 
But as far as making you think or wonder, then, <laughs> yeah, we did a real good job there. I'm like, what am I getting out of mm-hmm. this? You know, where, where is it going as it, you know, moves from front to back and across the, the senses? To me, this is a no-brainer at 42 bucks. I, I don't know about you, Zeke, but, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm probably going to get two of these. Like you said, PJ, I'm, I mean, I know you are a salesman. Not a very good one. No, because you're honest, <laughs> and that's why we like you and like having you on. But I do get some of those bourbon characteristics in there. So I think when you are a bourbon drinker and you don't want to go crazy, you know, you want to sit and sip one, sip two, and it's not going to kill you because the proof, I mean, it goes back to the proof. It's not a proof where you're going to have two drinks and it's going to knock you on your ass. Yeah. The molasses and the rum nature of it is going to be thick enough that you're not sitting there feeling like, oh, shit, I wasted a pour. You know, I or I need five X to get to where two X is going to give me it. It's a very thick, very enjoyable pour. I guess for me, I equate kind of whether a whiskey is thin or thick, like to getting your money's worth. And I know I shouldn't always do that, but if you're going to pay a certain amount of money, I don't want to feel like, hey, I'm drinking water. So you always used to tell the ladies they got their money's worth with you. <laughs> Heck no. I could have used to uh, to buy up a little bit myself. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know. No, I'm kidding. I, it's good for you. No, I'm, I'm, you know. I'm just happy I'm not the biggest guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on that. I'm working on it, too. All right, Zeke, what about you? What, what would you do with this? I mean, I'm by two. No, I've enjoyed most of these picks, honestly. Um like you mentioned earlier, I, I know both uh, Barrels and Brews and uh, Elixir had picks in the, in the market, and I took one of each of those and, and enjoyed drinking it. Rum's not my go-to, but... I'm the one who dabbles in rum more than you, yeah. Yeah, it's not just, I don't know, sometimes it's just not quite my jam. But no, I've enjoyed the picks I have, and especially, you know, rum's becoming more prevalent in the market for sure. At least some of the ones I've seen, the stuff people go after seems to be a little more heavily priced. And I've been more turned off by those, at least the ones I've tried, you know, a few dozen at least. So I, I enjoy something that, uh, you know, hits the right spots in the palate and also doesn't hurt the wallet as well. So where can the folks find Papa's Pillard? I mean, you said the States, but are you on the, the Grams and We are Twitters? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, all those social media, we're all over it. And please follow us. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Papa's Polar. Well, we uh, we look forward to that teaser reveal for what's coming in 2020. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's a really cool experience and uh, can't wait to share it with you guys. Well, go ahead and find PJ at Papa's Polar. Check out Papa's Polar on the grams and the tweets and the Facebooks and the face spaces and Zeke. People can find us at Dad's Drinking Bourbon on Facebook, at Bourbon Dads on Twitter. You can find us at Dad's Drinking Bourbon on Instagram. You can find us wherever you download your podcast. Please leave us an open and honest review, just like we leave open and honest reviews about the whiskey we drink. I want to let you know that all of our glassware is provided by distilleryproducts.com. Vicky over there is awesome. She will hook you up. Let me know. I will get you in touch with her. They have Glen Cairns. They have Wee Glen Cairns. They have the Tuith glass. They have the Neat glass. They're the only place in North America that can engrave the Neat glass. They have decanters, tumblers, whatever it is, they could do it. If you are a bourbon group, if you're a whiskey group, if you're a rum group, maybe you're a store and you're doing tastings or you want to have some merch to sell, go ahead, reach out to me. I will get you in touch with distilleryproducts.com they have wholesale prices that are great and you're going to get a great product from a great business i will tell you right now i found out about distilleryproducts.com by going to a distillery and saying hey who do you use for glasses and then i went to another distillery hey who do you use for glasses everyone was using distilleryproducts.com check them out they're good people. I also want to let you know this episode is sponsored by CastCartel.com, changing the industry standard of how you get your booze. You could be sitting on the couch. It could be late night. You realize you're out of something. It could be during the day. You're out and about. You're not going to be able to make it to the liquor store. You're a parent. 
You don't really want to take your kid in there. You're not like Zeke and I. Uh, <laughs> what? My kids don't go in scores. They'll break shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia makes me think she's going to sometimes, but she really just likes getting carted around in the, the shopping cart. She's pretty good. But... You know, maybe uh, you're you're not going to be able to make it to a store. You got to pick up your vodka, your gin, your mezcal, your tequila, your whiskey, your bourbon, your scotch, whatever it is. Go to uh, cascartel.com. They will get it shipped directly to your door. They're like the Amazon of the spirits industry. So you know those prices that are on there, they are matching merchants together with you. It's like Amazon in the early days before Amazon started taking on their own inventory. None of the inventories at Gas Cartel, they're getting you in touch with the merchants that have what you need and they can ship it right to you. Also go ahead and go on the um also go ahead and go on Instagram, follow at Cas Cartel. They're always doing awesome giveaways. And uh you never know when they're gonna send you something, but it lets you keep in touch with what they have going on. So go ahead and follow at Cass Cartel on Instagram. Zeke, where else can the folks find us? Nashville, Tennessee. Cheers. Ciao. Cheers. Thanks, PJ, for coming. No problem.